Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Readiness. When I read these two passages of scripture, readiness is the word that comes to mind. In Matthew, it is a readiness that is born from our desire to be with the bridegroom, to be with Christ. And in Ephesians, we are to be ready to face the challenges that come from the powers of this world and the power of the evil one. Both of these scriptures, I feel, are calling us to be prepared, which for me is very frightening because my own personality is one that is not always so prepared. In fact, my personality type, which I just recently revisited in a class that I'm taking, is an ENTP. And that's out of the Myers-Briggs type. And I'm just going to sum it up for you. We're the people that are waiting for everything else to fail. We're waiting for the plan to break. We're waiting for everything that was well set up to just fall apart. So we can come in because it doesn't phase us at all that there was no plan to begin with. That is the preparedness that I usually cling to. And so when I read our scripture for today, I realize I would be in the five unwise bridesmaids. But growing up, I was a boy scout. So through practice and repetition, I learned the motto of scouting. Be prepared. I, I suppose it didn't really take all that much practice or repetition to learn the two words be prepared, but it takes a whole lot of action to put it into practice. Being prepared requires foresight to know the problems that you are likely to face, it requires the right equipment, and it requires the skill and knowledge to use that equipment to reach your goal. In the reading from Matthew for today, the bridesmaids were in two groups, those who were prepared, who had extra oil, and those who weren't. And I will step this way to say that I was clearly with them. But when the bridegroom came, only those who were, who were prepared who were ready, were able to go in. Now, as I was preparing for this sermon, I was thinking this in my mind, and one thought continued to come back. What would MacGyver do if he was in this situation? Now, as a kid, I watched MacGyver reruns, and I found myself drawn to it whenever it was on. I was captivated by it. For those who are not familiar with the show, it really all focuses on one story arc that repeats every episode. The, portray the protagonist, MacGyver, sets out to do something, the bad guys get him into some kind of a bind, and MacGyver uses random things at his disposal to get out of said bind. Usually it ends up being, I don't know, something like a paper clip, a nine volt battery, and a rubber band all bound together just right so you can blow the door off of a prison cell. <laughs> yeah, it works, right? He's the poster boy for ingenuity, and I loved it because I saw myself in that. Who needs the right tools for the job when you can be that clever? The problem is that cleverness easily becomes the rival to readiness. You can begin to place all of your trust in your own ingenuity. And it feels good, because at the end of the day, you outsmarted the problem, and you get the credit for it. At the end of a MacGyver episode, no one thanks the paperclip. No one thanks the tools that were there. They thank the person who knew how to use it. However, when we look at our reading from Ephesians, Ephesians is a letter that exemplifies this idea that on our own, apart from the gifts of the community of God, and apart from the gift of freedom that we have in Christ, we can't do it. We are out of luck. The book of Ephesians is never about an individual standing up and fixing everything by themselves. It's about a community coming together and relying on Christ. And as we look at the specific reading for today, it becomes even more clear that cleverness, that ingenuity, that being quick on our feet is just not enough. The writer asks us to be strong, but it says to be strong in the Lord. We're asked to put on armor, but we're asked to put on the full armor of God. Now, armor has historically been something for the special, 
for the gifted, for those who are well-trained. In medieval times, armor was the symbol of the skill and ability of those people who wore it. It was a way to protect the person so that they would be ready for anything. The guy running around with a pitchfork did not have armor on. This was only for those who, who earned it, who deserved it. But the armor never supplies power. It just protected those who already had it. The writer of Ephesians takes these common parts of armor, the belt, the breastplate, and the shield, but he assigns them very uncommon values. Truth, righteousness, faith, so that the armor, which is usually the symbol of self-reliance, the symbol of being able to do it ourselves with the tools that we have at our disposal, is transformed entirely to a symbol of complete dependence on the power of God. Because without this, Ephesians tells us, the enemies we face will do us great harm. Verses 11 and 12 show us what it is that we are up against. So that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't do a thing against these kind of enemies on my own. I can't cleverly find a way to fight against these forces. I can't MacGyver my way to end the temptations in my life. I can't fasten a contraption together to fight the sinful nature that is a part of who I am. And I certainly can't use my own ingenuity to fight the systems of evil and oppression that are in this world. But Ephesians tells us we don't have to. Because this armor, this power, is available to us. But it's not available on demand. It requires that we take the time to put it on. We have to prepare. Fastening the belt of truth requires that we practice truth. That we seek out God's truth. And that's not something that we can just Google. To know the truth of God is to experience it, to read the words of scripture, to meditate on them, to know the truth that the message of the gospel brings to us, to seek truth in the relationships that we have with one another, to seek it in prayer. When we know this truth, when we know without deterrence the love that God has for us, Accepted as we are and offered freedom no matter what weight of sin we carry. When we know that by the power of Christ we are God's own people, what kind of a power, what kind of other power can stand against that in our lives? Likewise, putting on the breastplate of righteousness requires that we understand that God offers us so very much more than we ever deserve. We are offered the opportunity to put on the righteousness of God. Now, righteousness is one of these words that we throw around a lot. But to sum it up, righteousness is this visible quality of being right and correct and good. So even when we're not that, we get to place it on. Though we don't consider it or though we don't deserve it by the sake of our own actions, we live into this righteousness that Christ gives us. Now the next piece of armor that Ephesians talks about are the shoes that proclaim the gospel of peace. Now on my own, I have only ever had shoes that at best proclaim the gospel of kind of stinky. So here we are offered something so much greater. And I love the imagery that comes with shoes that lead us to carry a message of peace. We live in a world that is in such a short supply of it. War, feuding, violence, hatred. Young men killing one another in our own neighborhoods. Armed groups attacking towns and villages. 
or even the anger or resentment that grows within our own homes. We know what it is to experience an absence of peace, but to live as though our very footsteps are sowing seeds of content, to imagine that as we move through the day, we have the opportunity to leave a wake of peace. That is something to live out. That is a gift. And we are also called to take the shield of faith so that we would be able to quench the fiery arrows of the evil one. Now, a while back, I started to get into archery a little bit. And believe it or not, those arrows fly fast. I tell you, I was not expecting that. It can be hard to hold this shield. Sometimes we just want to keep our faith to ourselves. We don't want it to be something that's out here hanging up. We don't want to make it seem like we're pushing our faith on others. But how well does a shield protect you when you don't hold it up? What good is a shield if it's sitting back there, if it's not being used? But when we hold up our faith, when we cling to what we believe and we live it out in service to God and service to our neighbor, we are putting out those very fiery arrows of doubt. We are also called to take on the helmet of salvation. When we wear our salvation like a helmet, we can hold strong to the promise of Christ that we are offered new life. For those of us who have experienced baptism, this is a wonderful sign. Because as we approach the font, as we moved in and the holy waters are put on our heads, it's a reminder that it is a sign of God's action and movement in our life to bring relationship, both with the community that's there with us and with God who supports and saves us. When we put on salvation as a helmet, it's the same as remembering this promise of the water that was put on our foreheads. To live into that promise and to know that we are truly saved from our sinful nature, that we have a new life And the last piece that we are given is the sword of the Spirit, which is the very word of God. This is the only offensive thing that Ephesians lists. It's the only weapon that we have to face the evil in this world. Now, in youth ministry, I have seen this one get taken out of context, so I just want to make this abundantly clear. We are not called to go and hit someone upside the head with the Holy Bible. This is not the way that we use this weapon. In the same way, though, we're not called to go up and hit them verbally upside the head with it either. Remember, our enemy is not blood and flesh. Our foe is not the guy who likes to post discouraging things about religion on Facebook. Our enemy is not the person at work who chuckles when we talk about going to church or when they see us wearing a cross. Instead, we are given the gift of the word of God so that we can face the much larger problems of this world. Hunger, slavery, abuse, and every form of evil. We are called to carry the word of God to battle against these systems of oppression and bad rule. But to truly do this effectively, we have to train with it. We have to practice with it. We have to read it, to know it. Ephesians just carries this motif of battle and war. But for people who saw Roman centurions walking around the streets all the time, it makes a lot of sense. They saw daily what it meant to wear a breastplate or a belt or hold a shield. For us today, besides the fact that Halloween just ended, we don't see it so often. Instead, I want to just make a connection. So rather than a breastplate, you may wear an apron. You may wear a vest that has your name on it. Or a lab coat. There is no less righteousness there. Instead of carrying a shield, you may carry a school book. These things are no less a reminder of the gifts of faithfulness that we carry. Instead of a helmet, you may just put on a ball cap or even wear a hairnet. 
but that is just as much a reminder of the salvation that we have through Christ. These pieces of armor, they're given to us as gifts. But to see their benefit, to know the power that God provides in them, we have to prepare. We have to train with them to make them our own. When we truly do this, we do not need to be clever like MacGyver because we will truly be prepared to know where to turn so that we can stand firm in the Lord and the strength of his power. Amen.